This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to The Self-Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Do you know anyone who seems to be addicted to drama? Okay, don't answer that because we already know. But why? Why do we seem to keep having the same conflicts with certain people over and over? What's the problem? And are we playing a role in it, even if unwittingly? In this episode, me and Tiff discuss games people play. Our conversation was inspired by the late psychiatrist Eric Byrne, pioneer of transactional analysis and the author of the book, Games People Play, The Psychology of Human Relationships. What are the ego states and roles that we often assume in our relationships that create patterns of thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors which actually construct barriers to meaningful connection? Perhaps an even more important question than why do other people do this is, well, why do we do this? Especially when it brings about the experiences and outcomes in our relationships that we absolutely don't want. This is one of the many examples of why self-awareness is either the key to the lock on growth and development. If we're going to make positive changes in our relationships, we have to make positive changes in the way we relate, not only how we relate to others, but how do we relate to ourselves as well? Do we see each other and ourselves for that matter objectively? I mean, because it's not uncommon for us to play similar games when we communicate with ourselves as we do when we communicate with others. How do we recognize these patterns and is there a way that we can change them? I know you can't imagine this, but me and Tiff do go on a couple of tangents here and there. So this is going to be part one of our two-part Games People Play series. In the first part, we focus on ourselves, how people see us versus how we believe we're showing up. In the next part, we're going to discuss some of these games and explore some possible motives behind them. We hope you enjoy this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. And if you are in fact enjoying these episodes, check out Tiff's podcast, Roll With The Punches. It's a bit stating the obvious, but she's a dynamic, inquisitive host with a long list of extraordinary and fascinating guests. Welcome back. Not just you, Tiffany. Well, but welcome back to all the listeners. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Roll With The Punches and the Self-Help Antidote. I can't believe it's Thursday again. I don't know what day it is for you. I don't think it's Thursday, is it? No, it's Wednesday. I'm living in the past. It's my Thursday. That's my problem. Yeah, so I get really excited about Thursdays now because it's my Bobby day. But it feels like like this week is just gone. Tiff, that is so sweet. And beautiful to know that one of my dear friends like looks forward because I look forward to this day for the very same reason. I know I had a couple of customer service issues when we first got on the phone. So I didn't seem like I was in a really grateful state at that point. But trust me, the gratitude is always there because we have open and I think transparent authentic types of conversations, you know, on and off the podcast. Yeah. And you know, speaking of honest and open communication like what gets in the way of meaningful relationships i think that's what i want to talk about today a little bit because we mentioned i think we we mentioned like all these podcasts it's like this stream of conscious i don't even know like when what episode with who i said what but i know at some point we were talking about harvard and their longitudinal study they were conducting since like 1938 i believe and the one defining factor that everybody in the study had in common is is all happy people, self-reported happy people were people who had close, meaningful relationships Mm. in quality, not necessarily quantity. And if meaningful relationships is the key to happiness, what gets in the way? And, you know, I think one, one theory that came out was from the psychiatrist, Edward Burns back in Edward Byrne back in the 1960s, he pioneered transactional analysis and he talked about the different types of transactions that we engage in sometimes subconsciously sometimes intentionally 
sometimes intentionally, and we don't admit to other people or ourselves that we actually have a concealed intention. We're running rackets, kind of like the mob. <laughs> we'll get into that. But he said that, and, and this is something that I feel strongly about. Some people have beliefs, and then in a lot of cases, beliefs have us. So we didn't arrive at our beliefs through careful examination, analysis, experience, reflection. They were imposed upon us. They were almost injected into us because it was a thought that was repeated emphatically and consistently. And then we adapted it as that's just the way the world occurs. So he talks about that there are patterns of thoughts and beliefs and behaviors that are created through people through transactional analysis, where rather than having meaningful conversations, we step into roles, we step into ego states. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we engage in games for a variety of reasons. And, and one of three ego states that we're engaging in when we're playing these games or when we're even just subconsciously in these roles, it can be described as the adult, the parent, and the child. So the adult is neopsychic. In other words, in a neopsychic state, you're pretty much grounded situally, situationally and rationally with what's happening in the present, where an exteropsychic state represents itself as the parent. You're borrowing from an external reality and you're stepping into a certain role that's either nurturing or in some cases, highly critical. And then the, the other ego state that, you, that emerges is that of the child or the archaeopsychic state. And this is a relic of the past. It's someone you used to be, but as any child, you have a propensity to be highly intuitive, yet impulsive and dependent. And we always step into these roles, whether we realize it or not. And, and a game occurs when we mask our true intentions. So we masquerade as I'm engaging this behavior or this course of action because I want this. But in reality, that's not what I want. I want something else. But that something else I want is not socially acceptable. It's very selfish. So I have to present it altruistically in the name of looking good. So I choose to be right and look good rather than to cultivate meaningful relationships. And that wears away at real connection. So therefore it possibly wears away at true happiness because we've been talking about happiness a lot. Oh, this is, this is going to be a good conversation because you gave me a bit of a brief before of what we wanted to talk about, but I wasn't, you know, like <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to wait until Bobby starts talking about this to really get my head around what, where he wants to go with it. But it's, oh, it's really prevalent. I think even, well, not even for me, for everyone, but for me, because I'm looking at that outside angle of myself and relationships and people and people in my life and who I've been and the roles that I've played and and there's been a real mindset shift. So I'm getting real self-awareness and, and interest in this and I've had a lot of conversations with people lately, funnily enough, around this, around them expressing about a relationship they're in, maybe an intimate relationship sometimes, and when they talk to me, an outside person, about what they're in the middle of and their idea on it and their intentions. And I just think if only you could talk to that person, like there's nothing that you've said that is that is negative. And I feel like if you could say exactly this to the person who you deep down just love and want to fix this relationship, everything would be okay. What stops us from doing that, Bobby? I think there's so many layers to that. My answer to everything is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> because when you get into something as complex as human behavior, and when you talk to someone who's as limited intellectually as I am, you cannot arrive at a definitive, well, it's this. It could be a lot of different things. It could be on different levels. Like one thing that I was reading recently is research that they did on rats. So, so you talk about 
when people are playing games or, or, or maybe some of those games come out being quite aggressive, um, even violent games that we play, these, these games are not inconsequential. Although some of them are subtle and innocent, others, the stakes could be quite high. And one question that came up in a podcast many, many months ago was around, well, why do people in abusive relationships stay? And well, there's a lot of psychological reasons. It could be that they truly believe it's their mission to save or change that person. So they have a savior complex because that savior complex gives them significance and gives them security. It could be they don't think they could do any better. You know, they could be terrified of what happens if they leave that person. They might have a low sense of self-worth that makes them feel, well, without this person, as horrible as they are, who would I be? And, and all of these things might be helpful but there's so much more that could be going on. And they did this, this study with rats where they would expose these rats to a noxious odor and that odor would be linked to an electric shock. So after a while, if you, know, you receive an electric shock, every time you smell this odor, you're going to try to avoid the place where you smell the odor. Yes. So if you're a smart rat, and there was a lot of smart rats in this study, they avoided that odor. But when you deal with pups who are in the presence of their mother, their glucocort, uh, their, 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 um, God, I, my brain today. So their stress hormone levels, right? Yes. Glucocorticoid levels in the brain is suppressed within the first few weeks of life because elevated stress hormones can be damaging to a developing mammalian brain. So they basically let mom handle everything. So without the presence of elevated stress hormones, they don't develop this aversion to that smell which is very interesting. So they're completely dependent on mom. So if mom is abusive to let's say the pop or neglectful, you know, you would say like the behaviorists would say, well, based on the conditioning, you know, try to avoid that parent, right? Well, that's not what they do. What they do is they cling even harder to the parent because it's that important for, for them to connect to their caregiver and there was a horrible study that was done with monkeys. Harlow conducted it. Mm. And they, they had these makeshift mothers. And every time that they would try to approach the mother, because that connection between mother and child is so essential to the proper development of that, of that infant monkey. I think what, what, are, what are baby monkeys called? They're called uh, infant monkey, whatever. And there would be Mon this. <laughs> monkeys. No, that those, those are the dancing monkeys in high heels <laughs> on Broadway. It's, it's an amazing show. Have you ever seen it? The monkeys? I, I mean, like, yeah, it's, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the hairy legs and the high heels, it's a little bit scary at first, but once you get past that, they got rhythm. They're all so coordinated. It's a very, it's a very uplifting experience. So yeah. Anyway, so there'd be this incredibly like disruptive blast of air coming out of these makeshift monkeys and and you would think that they would avoid coming in contact, but what they do is it's so sad. They cling on harder and harder because of that desperation. So going back to like, why do people say it could be something within your conditioning, you know, based on a experience you have that you don't even remember. So there are so many reasons why people do the things they do. Maybe it's, maybe it's, if, if we took a look at basic human needs, it's rooted in that. I want to be significant and maybe I don't feel that I bring anything of significance. So the way I do this is I engage in a game and I play with you again, either unintentionally or intentionally, maybe I feel safer, you know, because it, like every relationship I've ever been in or every close friendship, it doesn't have to be romantic has ended. So, you know, if I can't have safety that comes from trust, well, I'll have certainty that comes from trying to control you. Mm. I want to make two points. One is I saw recently a quote with a, a picture of a child and it said, a child who is abused by its parents doesn't learn to hate the parents. It learns to hate itself. Mm. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's exactly what happens, right? Because you, yeah, they, they still stay attached to the parents, but they learn to hate themselves. And the other thing is that that study you spoke about, I talked would be the same one or a similar version Dr. Vanessa LaPointe, the child psychologist, talked about that, the orange blossom scent and the rats and said that, that 
it was proven that seven generations later they would still get a stress response from the scent of orange blossom. So it highlights that. Wow. So it was the- orange blossoms. I was like, it's a noxious odor. Yes. <laughs> orange blossoms sound so much lovelier. But, um, and somebody but recently said sometimes. that it's now been proven since then that it's actually 17 generations, which is just a lifetime. But what that highlights to me is we're running around trying to fix what's wrong with me. Why do I do this? And the oh, answer, that's such a good point. The answer is 17 generations ago. So as if we're going to have a clue, like the games we're playing aren't intentional. They're built into generations of systems. How the f- I have got to. So, so here's where I read that. Okay, I've got to recommend a book, book of recommendation. Um, Robert Sapolsky, um, a big fan of his, his book, Behave. If, if anybody ever thinks they have any inclination about why anybody does anything, <laughs> and usually, especially if you're on social media, it, it's either black and white, left or right. Like there are definitive reasons why, well, because they're stupid, they're lazy. <laughs> it's like, no, if you, especially if, if you have a negative connotation attached to why you think anybody does anything buy this book it, it's it's a it's it's a quick easy read it's just about 700 pages so just like some light reading he does get into some stuff but he walks you through not just the biochemistry that's taking place in your brain milliseconds before you engage in a behavior but hours months years decades centuries millenniums So he walks you right down that rabbit hole about so many factors influencing behavior that you couldn't possibly in certain instances know why you did what you did. Not to mention somebody else knows why you did what you did. Yeah, it brings up, I think I've mentioned to you before, two hideous short relationships I had that... (laughs) right before I threw the towel in on dating at all because I realized that I was running a racket. But, um, I mean, this this speaks right to it. So years ago I started seeing someone for a very short period of time, a handful of months, and it became – and then crap went on and I realized this person was not great. It was a toxic relationship. It was was not going to be great for me, so I moved away from it, had to get an intervention order. Three years later – I didn't date for three years. Like it was, it went on for quite a while. So it was not, you know, I wasn't, I was in no hurry to step back out and meet guys. <laughs> and then t- uh, three years later, I go to my mate. We should, that was a long time ago. I've been busy. That's, I should probably go and date again. Went on a date, went on three dates with this particular person. Same thing rolled out, same toxic personality type. Their ex had a, a intervention order on them. I ended up having to get an intervention or them after three dates. It was crazy. And I went to myself, all right, like I'm something like that was a game that I was playing. Now I wasn't driving that game. I wasn't choosing that game. I had no idea what the origin of what's happening was, but I knew that I was the main player in the game. So it took yeah, so myself you- out of the game and I've spent a whole lot of years trying to figure out the game so that I can step back in and play a different game. But this is where it gets tricky because it's like all of your friends want to tell you that those dudes are the problem. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm I'm the one walking into that situation and choosing that. Obviously I didn't choose it. I didn't choose it based on something I saw. It's something that unfolded. It wasn't something I could see, but it's something that I realized I was going to need to learn to recognize what was mm-hmm. I getting attracted to in, to allow that to happen. See, that's a good question. And I want to talk about that in just a little bit. My disclaimer here is, you know, I said, well, God, there are some things that you couldn't possibly know why you do what you do, but there are some things that through reflection mm. and self-awareness, you do start to get insight. So it's not like everything in in your brain is a black box. You know, there are some psychological uh, reasons why you're doing what you're doing. And a little bit of introspection could help unlock or or illuminate some of those things. Mm -hmm. It's just human behavior is complex. That's pretty much the only point I I was trying to make. But I mean, we we can sit here and surmise it because why do you do what you do? I mean, let's say I've been so hurt with relationships that I never truly want to commit to another relationship again, but 
that's not my identity, right? That that's not socially acceptable. You know, I'm too afraid to put myself out there. So what I do is I say, well, I'm trying, I'm trying. So I constantly attract people who I know are wrong for me because something will go wrong. Eventually the relationship will end. So I don't have to really expose myself and be vulnerable. I don't mean like expose myself, expose myself. (laughs) Very bad thing to do on a first date. Like if you're doing that and dates aren't working out, yes, it is your fault. It's not the other person. You need serious help, maybe medication. Who knows? Maybe incarceration. But what was the point I was making? So the point I was trying to, to, to make here is, yeah, behavior is complicated. And, you know, sometimes it's like as I could still tell myself a story. Oh my God, you know, and play the game. Kick me. Everyone else does. Nothing ever works out. I meet all the wrong girls and my friends can tell me it's not my fault, even though, you know, yeah, sometimes it is the other person, but you're always playing a role in that in some way, shape or form. But as long as I keep denying that and keep saying that I'm out there, I'm looking, but I'm looking for people who I know it won't work out. So kind of, I could maintain my avoidance strategy, hence running a racket, pretending to have one intention, but protecting my true intention underneath it. And what's that human need? Like, why do people do what they do? Because now I feel a little bit safe Mm. or safer than I would because I'm miserable. I don't like the state I'm in, but it's the lesser of two evils from exposing myself to potentially even more pain. Yes. People are going, so what's the takeaway? I hear people like, so what's the takeaway? What do I do? What do I do? (laughs) How do I fix it? What are the steps? (laughs) Where do, like, where do we start? I just feel like I've, I've paid attention to this stuff in myself and in my life for quite a while. And when you start to, like, I've figured out a lot of stuff and I feel like I've evolved and I've changed and my level of self-awareness is a thousandfold what it was 10 years ago. But how do you replicate that? Sometimes I wonder if if it is even something we can teach. We can talk about it and people that are ready can, can come and lean in and pennies will drop. But, you know, it's one of those things that I even wonder, can we... I just can't imagine anyone coming coming to me at any point before, you know, these recent times and just blurting all that out to me. This is, you know, like, oh, this, 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 all the things I know and believe now telling me that and me not punching them in the face, you know, because <laughs> oh. I wasn't ready, because I wasn't evolved. I wasn't, you know, sometimes the Don't ruin right. my illusion. <laughs> I mean, because if you think about it, like society for a large portion of us, not us, not, not me and you and not the listeners, we're, in, we're really evolved, but <laughs> other people, it's like, there's an illusion. We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as mm. we are. And I'm living this illusion and I could deny reality. I could deny your reality, my reality, but it keeps me safe. It keeps me from being vulnerable again, exposed And just don't violate that illusion. So Mm. I'll even surround myself with enablers, you know, Mm -hmm. and those people who, who they support my illusion. I want them around anyone who tries to expose me to a different reality or confront the illusion that I'm in. Well, they're a threat. Mm -hmm. I'm either going to fight those people or I'm going to avoid those people. So Mm -hmm. we go out and seek patterns of interactions between us and others that sometimes support the illusions that give us a sense of safety when facing what's underneath the surface emotionally, psychologically is too scary or we're not ready. We're not at that point. Yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is interesting because it's something that over the recent, you know, the last couple of years has been in my wheelhouse. And so, you know, I've been single for a long time and, very avoidant and kept people at arm's length and known that and uh, it got to a point where I you know in more recent times I was I was talking to someone and I said I look now at the handful so I've de- been very deliberate in who I surround myself with I always have to a degree but I've been very deliberate about it um especially in 
career because it's the one place where I feel really driven and passionate and I know where I want to go and I know who's got good energy and you know so I'm hanging out with you and harps for most of my life it's great <laughs> but, you know I've got this great working community in my career space but I thought I looked at my relationship space because that's always been the place where I, I have my struggles and I went well who am like I'm often like the majority of the people outside of the business, my business world, the majority of people that I'm connecting with are long time single people as well who aren't dating and connecting and who a bit like me can kind of just disappear and then reappear intermittently. And so I go, do I want, do I want people like my like I have been for a big part for too big a part of my life, which I've spent a lot of time changing over the recent years, developing good relationships where I'm there all the time and I'm open and and I don't just disappear when life's hard for me, so that no one knows that I'm not just the superstar. It's like, well, if stuff's hard and you know it's okay still to reach out to people and connect and say I'm having a shitty time. But I, I started looking at that and going, well. Is, is it just by default because I'm single that they're, that I meet single people because they're more open to meeting people and connecting or wouldn't it be interesting if I realised that I was deliberately picking the relationships that I couldn't really overly connect to because they were comfortable and I was triggered by anything deeper? Yeah, they're very, very possible, isn't it? Mm. There's a number of possibilities, but I've watched as a friend and as a fan of Roll With The Punches mm -hmm. as a fan of the You Project, I've watched you become more self-aware mm -hmm. to evolve into the type of person who asks these questions, who reflects, and who who's interested in self-discovery. Do you think that having all these conversations with people on the hundreds of podcasts that you do, and you are vulnerable, you're vulnerable with your audience. There is a relationship there. It's not that you're presenting information. You are, you're yeah. presenting guests, but there's a dialogue. When you're speaking to your guests, you're also speaking to your audience and you're, you're opening up in quite a profound way in some of these episodes. Do you think it's all of these conversations, it, it, quote unquote, in the professional space that gives you permission to do this, that's opening you up to a little bit more self-awareness around your, your personal dynamics? 100%. And, I, and I've, I noticed that and chose it to be my intention when I saw what happened in the same instance in the boxing ring, when I, when I had that experience in the boxing ring over years, it, everything outside of the boxing ring changed. And when I realized very early on that who is this open, vulnerable, honest human that is hosting role with the punches that didn't used to have the ability to connect and ask people deep questions. I would never ask a deep question in real life to people because I did, I, I think unbeknownst to me, I didn't want to be opening myself up. I didn't want them to pry back in to what might be underneath me. None of this was conscious. I wasn't deliberately hiding anything, but I think there was a level of something. And so when I do this, like I've just kind of relented and gone, well, that this is who I am on the podcast. But the beauty of that is the intention of that means that what I do here, what we do, how we do one thing is how we do everything. And it's changing the outside. It doesn't matter sometimes how we get to the on-ramp of, of self-awareness. It's just a matter that we get there. Mm. You know, so some people like take a certain road or a certain method or, or, or form of therapy, coaching, and they, they develop these biases towards this methodology. And it, you know, sometimes you can get somewhere you know, when you're on the way to somewhere else. What I mean by that is, was it, was it Lisa that was talking to me about this? Where, oh, I, th I think it might have been Lisa Stevenson. Um, I'll give her credit for this. Anyway, where, where she had, sometimes you have clients and they have so much stuff in intrapersonally, interpersonally, and they won't go there. It's, it's too scary. It's too scary. It's too much of a threat to their identity. But if you talk to them about, okay, well, let's coach around leadership and, and communication 
at work. It's like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, of course, leadership and, you know, develop professional development. Yes, I'm all about that. That's my identity. And the funny thing is, you're not talking to them about work. You're talking about themselves, them, who they bring to work that's getting in the way. And they'll go there and, yeah. and they'll let you into those more painful spaces of their lives and their psyche because it, it just makes sense in the frame that you're presenting. Yeah. Oh, you know, that happened. Dr. Bill, we like to bring him up. <laughs> happened <Dr. Bill. laughs> last year when I was talking he, to him. He's our Dr. Phil. <laughs> totally are. Oh, well, come along for the ride, everyone. I'm in therapy. <laughs> but what's interesting about that point is we were talking about a really specific scenario and a really personal scenario, so I won't go right into it, but we were talking about this this context of something in a in our conversation. And then we were talking about something in business, a completely different conversation. And he said he said something and I said Oh, my reaction was just like, well, in you know, people can't hurt me unless I choose to let them or something like that. But it was, and there was just this huge contrast. And he went, ah, see what, see what you just said. And we reflected on that. Ever since that moment, like therapists or people or friends or anyone that's having these conversations, they don't have to say much. All he had to do was shine a light on. And then all of a sudden I realized, well, that's who I am. It doesn't matter whether it's in, you know, scenario A that we were talking about before where I didn't feel like that person and I was pl- I would play a different role. It, it just, it was, a, I don't know, it was, I'm explaining it terribly, but it was profound and that conversation changed me because I realised, yeah. ah, why am I playing this role over in corner A over here that is really disempowering and I'm dragging along a lot of emotional bullshit and, it's, and through that, unintentionally, I know that it's making me go out into the world and seek those experiences when really in every other aspect of my life, I'm this person. And yeah, no one can mm. hurt me unless I choose to let them. And you, you know this, and a good coach, a good therapist, you know, they're not there to present a worldview to you. They're there to help you examine things mm. that are right in front of you. Because if you just had, and this is why it, it drives me nuts with, you know, coaching is about asking great questions. Mm. No, that's an element of coaching. So if you have five great questions, first of all, if you walk in with a preconceived notion and I'm not saying there is a structure and there's a plan in coaching, but if you walk in, I'm going to ask these three questions because they are the, are you really with the person or are you with your script of what you think you should be bringing and not open to what actually happens, but reflection is so powerful because I, it, let's say I, here, I came up with, oh, here it is right here on Google. The five best questions you could ever ask anyone in any scenario for coaching. That's not true. I didn't Google that, but let's say that's what came up. And I gave you those five questions, right? Yeah. Well, now that's, I, that's great coaching. No, first of <laughs> all, that's ridiculous. Second, if you went home and you asked yourself those questions, as you're answering those questions, Along with that comes your rationalizations. So it doesn't matter what your answer is. You're going to rationalize your answer and construct it in a way that allows you to perpetuate your pattern where what a good therapist, in this case, Dr. Bill would do is like use a reflection to illuminate something that you were overlooking or rationalizing, but now you see it more clearly and maybe from a different vantage point. And through that, they unlock your own self-discovery because you know, and you know, you know. Yeah. And you know what I've just realized was so powerful about that session is he actually never, he never said or alluded to or had any leaning towards which of those, all he highlighted were there were two completely opposing ideas. And, and he I was the one that went, oh, there's two things happening here and reflected and I chose which one. I realized which one was the racket and which one was the reality, not him. He didn't go, oh, see, you can do that and talk me into it. He just went, oh, that's interesting. And in my mind I go, oh, that's the polar opposite to what I did in that other thing. All right. Oh, that other thing's not true. I don't have to be that person. That's profound. That is profound. And if he had have jumped in and tried to lead me there before I'd 
gone through it myself, I don't think I would have got there. I would have fought it. I'm a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> I love the accent when she says that. <laughs> so it's, the thing is like, what do you do about the games that people are playing with you is one question. I think the, the deeper question is, what do you do about the games you're playing with yourself and others? Because mm. because we just don't have rackets with other people. You know, again, like rackets are where, you know, you, you go to the dry cleaners and that's a very respectable business. But, you know, what they're really doing is laundering something else. So that's like, that's like, that's like what we mean when we're talking about a racket. So just to reiterate, when you present one intention, but behind that is a different intention, mm. a less socially acceptable intention, and you manipulate around your true intention, masquerading as something else, that's running a racket. But a lot of times we, we run rackets, not only other people, but with ourselves, because we have rackets about our rackets. So we keep ourselves from ever really discovering or acknowledging what it is that we're doing. And like, mm. we, we might be like, again, the savior running around, I help everybody. And it's like, well, you know, in, in reality, you're doing that because you want to be needed. Mm. It's not even about mm -hmm. them. So you're on a racket, but, but you have a racket about your racket. You've even convinced yourself, yeah. you know, that's about, and I'm, and I'm not saying that people who go around helping everybody are not deeply caring because a lot of them are, but some of them, it's like, it's transactional, right? Yeah. Transactional analysis, the term transactional analysis, it's pretty straightforward. It's we, we have these transactions or these games that we're playing with ourselves. And it just keeps us from really confronting our, our true intentions or even beyond our true intentions. What's the need that that intention is attempting to fulfill? Mm. Again, like where's the beginning of that? Imagine, imagine, <laughs> Yeah, it's the same as what I said before. Imagine walking up to me when I was 29 and I'd stepped in the boxing ring and I was like, oh, yeah, look at me. I'm in the boxing ring. Look, I'm amazing. I'm strong. I'm like if someone, before I asked the questions to myself, if someone said it, had said, actually, Tiff, I don't know if you're all that independent and strong and resilient. I actually think that you're scared of vulnerability and you are hiding things about yourself that you feel ashamed of. I would have punched them in the face with one of my well-trained left hooks. Rightfully so. Like, fuck off. Who asked you? Who is this person? <laughs> like, 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 I'm just, listen, I'm just trying to buy some fucking milk here. Can you ring me up, please? <laughs> like, you know, I- I, I don't need this confrontation at the till. <laughs> <laughs> Harps and I have, I, uh, a little, 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 let me start that again. Harps and I have had- uh, It's contagious. You know, <laughs> hey, we have conversations where he talks about me wearing a hat that says bring it in and give me a hug and a t-shirt that simultaneously says fuck off i and listened to that episode i was yeah. laughing so hard i nearly ran over three people <laughs> <laughs> so there was another episode he had with someone on his show and he did it with melissa so i wasn't in the conversation but they would it was a psychologist and he would and he mentioned that that conversation with me and that, that way that I am. And he used the term um, that I can be quite defensive. I have a quite a defensive armor. And, you know, it was so interesting because when I heard that and I went into a good couple of weeks of really deep considered thought about how everybody is experiencing me. And I was really hyper aware of, the level of defensiveness that I carried around still today, which is a lot less than normal. But it was so interesting because I, I didn't take offense to it, but it just for some reason made me really interested. Wow. How do people truly perceive me? That That's a question that requires a lot of self-awareness to even just present itself like that. Mm. Forget about the answer. That that's That's a different level. Yeah, because because there's somebody that I've spent I spend a lot of time with and I value deeply, and then I think I wonder who else I have relationships with, where if they were to have private conversation with somebody else, and yes, they yes we have a great relationship, and of course they they love and respect me, but how many of them would say, 
like she's a good chick, but she's really defensive. Mm. Like, you can't really get to know her. She doesn't really let anyone in. And this is, and that'd be me still thinking that I'm not those things. And think about like, you don't want to be defined by other people's opinions, but you need to have a level of sensitivity towards them because that is a reciprocal relationship between self-awareness and that openness and how openness generates self-awareness. How do people see me? Yeah. And, And what am I doing specifically that might create that picture that people have of me in their mind, what words, what adjectives would they use to describe me? And what would I want that to be in the future? Mm. And what version of me would that be? I, I think mm. we talked about, I know, I know I talked with Susan Sly about just method acting where it's not faking another character in, in the self-transformation sense of the word. It's imagining a, a version of that you no longer are like, like in transactional analysis, there's parts of us that are still the child, but yeah. we're also not that. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it's yeah. a version of us, but it's not the totality of us. We're different as an adult, or we should be different as an adult with different needs. And sometimes we revert back to that, that child state. So whether Mm -hmm. you're being the parent and being critical of someone and nurturing, whether you're being the adult and being measured, grounded in present tense reason, or you're the child that's impulsively grabbing for something that that's dependent on, on other people, like overly dependent on other people. Now, however you show up in, in, in any of those, they're, they're versions of you. So who's the version of you in the future mm. that you would, that you would want to cultivate? Because, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, where are you, you're going to five years from now, you're either going to arrive by design or by default. What was a post I read the other day? You're, you're either being paid for the decisions you made in the past, or you're paying for the decisions you made in the past. And that seems to suggest that it's advocating for the creation of oneself, you know, not Mm. finding yourself, but creating yourself, deciding who you want to be and stepping into that. We all do that. You know, like, Mm. like Craig Harper's going for his PhD right now. So he'll he'll emerge Dr. Harper. He wasn't Dr. Harper five years ago, Mm -hmm. but he will be. And Mm. there were very specific decisions and actions and strategies and mannerisms and characteristics and habits that he had to step into in order to evolve into Dr. Harper, the person who is, unless something derails him, inevitably going to show up in the future. Mm. That's the future that is emerging right now. So how do I want people to perceive me? And who would that person be? What would their temperament be like? What would it be like to be around them? How would they engage with other people? You know, and, and what essentially are the attitudes and behaviors of that person. And if I, if I start, because maybe it's not looking in the past, like, ah, let me understand exactly what my motivations were and why did I do Maybe it's like looking in the future that could kind of help us live in, in a way where we don't play these games because we don't feel threatened by our vulnerability Mm -hmm. and letting other people in. A hundred percent. I mean, you look at, all of the work I'm doing now is about being vulnerable and connecting and being seen and, you know, and then the, one of the main people in my life is still using that description of their experience of me. And so that's, there's no better learning than going, well, I can say that these are all the things I'm working on and I can do the theory around it. But out in the world of experience, I'm ready to step into that because that feedback or hearing that description of how somebody described me, that's gotten me ready to take the next step. That's not where I want to be. Anna said something interesting. You know, we keep talking about Craig, Craig and, you know, Craig Hopper. (laughs) We're talking about our good friend. If you're not already a listener, (laughs) he is the host of the You Projects. And we keep referring to Craig. Who's this Craig guy? (laughs) 
that's what we're talking about. I'm, I'm really sorry. And another one of um, our friends and a great guest on it was on the show very recently. And I resonated with her discussion around observation. And we talked about this, like with failure in, in our episode on failure, where we, we attach such a big deal. What if we were just curious? What if it was an experiment? And the purpose of an experiment is not to have it go one way or another, but to learn, mm -hmm. to learn and, and, and be able to conduct a better experiment. You know, so well, what if she was, what if we would look at two interactions, one that's highly intentional, like I'm going out to meet somebody for coffee. What's my outcome? Mm -hmm. It might be to make them feel seen. It might be to make them laugh because, you know, they're, they're, they're stressed out. They're going through a lot and a little bit of levity you know, and escapism would benefit that. And you go in there with that intention and then experiment with just what happens. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that this has to be the new you, right? Because we talked about failure and, and there's a point of diminishing returns, like mm. small doses of failure kind of build up a, a, a tolerance for it. And, and it helps you reflect because you have, you have a smaller chunk to reflect on, you know, don't go, you know, quitting your job without a plan B, that's, that's a lot of failure, the risk benefit ratio, or you know what, maybe that is the right course of action. What do I know? But taking shorter experiments, where there's a palatable level of risk, sometimes is better than like putting all your money on one horse, so to speak. So if you would just experiment with an outcome, what happens when I show up totally vulnerable. And I don't care. I don't, I, I don't have to worry about what type of conversation we're going to have. I don't even have to worry about the next words out of my mouth. I could just show up in a state of anticipation and curiosity. And what if I dealt with people that way? And, and you don't have to own it. If it's like, you don't like it, just, just tr this one time and observe what happens. Mm. I think, I think a really powerful question as well as like, what going back to values, what is most meaningful to me? What is most meaningful to me that I want to show up in all areas of relationships, life and, and work? And what is my current way of being with people and the games I play with? We didn't even go into what the games are. It's kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's funny. But what's that costing me mm. in terms of my values? Mm. So I, I, I know that you know, I'm trying to protect myself from something or it's giving me something. But is what it's giving me worth what I'm losing? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I know that you've got another hour's worth of content on this topic because we didn't even talk about all of the stuff that you mentioned. So we're going to continue the theme of this episode next week, correct? Have you got another Game. full episode for us? Yeah, I want to get into what the games actually are. We never right. got to that. And like examples of them. That's because I get on the couch. That's why I get on the couch and put you in the therapist chair and then we just get lost in that. <laughs> no, but I'm just going to be telling really cheeky stories <laughs> and relating them back to, to, to the specific game. All right. Well, everyone, self-help antidotes, roll with the punches. Thank you for tuning in. Bobby and I love you and we will be back next week to continue talking about the games people play. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future. 